This is the show for grown ups. And they say bad words. And they say bad words. Say final warning. Final warning. And now, the exciting conclusion of Trail of Cthulhu, A Dance in the Blood. Richard, you return back to Jeffrey, much in the same way you found him. He's lying in the exact same position, looking out the exact same window, completely still. You notice that his chest is not rising or falling. I'm checking my chest to see if it's rising or falling as I breathe. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) It is. As you're looking at him, he turns to you and goes, oh, brother, you've returned. He's still not breathing. Did you bring the medicine? Yes, Jeffrey, I, I brought the medicine. But I just give him like an aspirin that I had in my doctor's case. I know full well there's nothing I can give him. I don't even know what's wrong with him, but if it'll make him feel better in his mind, I'll just give him an aspirin. So he, he puts the aspirin in his mouth. He t- takes a glass of water and tries to drink it. And it looks like it's like not natural to him anymore to drink. Like he has to tilt his head back and like kind of like wait for gravity to do its thing and take the pill down with it. He kind of looks at you and goes, I, I don't know what to do. You're beyond any help that I can give you alone. I, I think we better get you to the hospital. Uh, the hospital is back in Keswick. Not a huge deal. It's a very short ferry ride back over. So the, the hospital itself is this big, dark, looming monstrosity of a building. It's the main medical center for the entire Lick area. So you know that by reputation, this is a very good hospital. As you check him into the front desk, you see the doctor comes by. He introduces himself as Dr. Rochdale. He's an older man, very well kept, very proper looking, pristine white coat, big head pizza cutter, the biggest one you've ever seen. You know he's a good doctor. And he reaches over and shakes your hand and goes, Hi, I'm Dr. Rochdale. What, what seems to be the problem today? My brother seems to be exhibiting traits of, well, frankly, the the dead. As you can see, he clearly is not dead, but... I can't seem to find a pulse on him. And matter of fact, wait. No, still have a pulse. I still have a pulse. So uh, he does not have a pulse. I clearly do. Clearly. <laughs> I don't want to brag or nothing. <laughs> but uh, I can't seem to find his. I didn't know if there was maybe something local that he could have gotten into to, to put him in this state. I was hoping you could help me diagnose him. So he kind of looks at you like, okay, buddy. And he goes, well, um, you know, I'm sure you've done your best, but why don't we let a doctor make the judgments here? Yeah, you never said you were a doctor. So you just sound even nuttier now. Well, clearly I'm a doctor because I have a pizza cutter on my head. Not not as big as yours. <laughs> <laughs> but we're both wearing pizza cutters. Uh, I can see you're a doctor from your pizza cutter in black nondescript bag. <laughs> <laughs> right this way. <laughs> So he takes a wheelchair and wheels Jeffrey back into a private room. He gets him all set up in bed and asks the nurse to get various IVs and whatnot. He takes his pulse, or tries to, several different areas. He asks the nurse to bring a syringe so he can draw blood. He tries to draw blood and he can't. He can't find a vein. He's able to stab Jeffrey in the arm. Jeffrey doesn't react. He pulls nothing. He he is I I can't understand it. He kind of, a nurse, give us the room. I'd like to speak with Dr. Laws here. And the nurses gather their things and leave. Uh, Jeffrey, we'll be right back. Why don't you um, just rest, okay? And Jeffrey nods. So he takes you aside. I would love to say we've never seen this before, but, you know, I, I am somewhat of, a, of an antiquarian. I, I enjoy some of the more bizarre medical histories I've read, and I, I have seen something akin to what your, your brother is exhibiting now. What is it? A similar case of uh, a woman by the name of Betty came into the hospital over a hundred years ago now exhibiting the same thing as no pulse no breath detected she, she was dead but she was fully animate and conversational betty um betty waring waring yes what what happened to her well that's where it gets believe it or not even stranger it seems one night she disappeared she Towards the end, she she got rather violent. She had to be, uh, we couldn't sedate her, but they, they tied her down as best they could just to keep her from injuring herself or the staff. And one day she disappeared. She just wasn't found. She's gone. Out the window. It looks like she jumped. Now, she was on the third floor. It fall like that. It should have killed her. 
but it didn't. We never found the body. She was never seen again. I shouldn't have said anything. I don't want to frighten you or say that's what's going to happen to your brother. Of course, we don't know. But it, uh, I couldn't help but think of the similarities of the case. You understand. You're a man of, of science. And I think you should roll a stability check there. Yeah, I'm shook. You have to write a rule of five or above now. Two. <laughs> I believe you would lose. I'm going to say a three. It sounds like a good number here. All right. So now I'm at negative three stability. <laughs> Yep. We'll, of course, we'll, we'll keep good care of your brother. Um, you're welcome to stay. Visiting hours don't apply. If anyone asks, just say that you're a consulting doctor. Well, thank you, doctor. And I shake his hand. He shakes your hand. And as I'm shaking his hand, I check, check for a pulse. pulse. He's got a nice, strong pulse for an old man. I feel somewhat relieved by that. <laughs> and immediately check mine. <laughs> yeah. Still a pulse. Still a pulse. Uh, so let's go back to Jenna at the library. So I'm thinking that I'm looking for information on Old Manus. It's confusing. You see, there's two sets of dates when you ever look up things on Low Manus. And the librarian herself is a very kind woman. And she's happy to help you. She's somewhat of a transplant herself, so she doesn't have the knowledge of a, of a long-time town librarian, unfortunately. But she says, well, oddly enough, you have two manistees um, before our current manistee, the non uncreatively named low manistee, and an earlier one they called lower manistee. You find that lower manistee was destroyed. You find it through parish records using your library signs. It was destroyed in 1697. The whole village was razed. Even the buildings were torn apart. You find ecclesiastical correspondences from the area's bishop at the time decrying blasphemous devils tearing apart low man, lower manistee. And then in 1816, the newer manistee, but not the current version of manistee. So you find a volume of, of historical uh, lore explains uh, just a rash of deaths in 1816. So I'm assuming that it must be some kind of plague. Sure. Because... You know, I, I can't psychologically cope with whatever. And the other one must have been a natural disaster. The, you know, it's not possible that the buildings were literally torn apart. She, uh, she says to you, you know what? You may find a local guy to take you to the ruins. They, they do still exist. Of course, uh, they're, they're on the shore. Low Manistee is built further inland than Lower Manistee, which is built very close to the, the resources of the time. Who would that be? Eugene. There's a pig farmer named Eugene who's... If you put enough liquor into him, he'll tell you anything. Some of it will even be true when she laughs. Yeah. She just tells you that um, Eugene can be found whenever he's not tending his pigs. He can be found at the hotel where you're staying. He frequents the bar. So I'm, gonna, I'm assuming that was the guy who smelled before. Yep. Yep. And I'm going to go upstairs thinking I'm going to find Michael. Because I have no reason to think he's anywhere else. Of course, Michael's not there. He didn't leave a note behind. You come back down and Ada says, if you're looking for your friends, they, they left earlier. Mr. Laws seems in an awful way. I, I believe they were headed to Keswick. Dr. Laws will be back by dinner time. Oh, and here's Dr. Laws now. You both sit down at the table or you go back to Jeffrey's room, perhaps. I'm saying sit back down at the table. Okay. Yeah, that room skeeves me out. <laughs> okay. I figured it would. So you sit down at the table. Um, in the corner, uh, you're brought coffee, some light food, and you're able to tell each other what you've discovered. So, I'm sorry I had to leave you, but Jeffrey was in a terrible way. I brought him to the hospital, and they don't know what's going on with him. Uh, I was able to talk to the doctor there, and he told me of a similar case, and this is where it gets even stranger, I'm afraid. He told me of a Betty wearing 100 years ago with similar symptoms. No pulse to be found in an awful way and jumped out of a third story window at the hospital after escaping her shackles. They never recovered a body. I fear Jeffrey's in for the same fate. I'm going to put my hand on his hand in a, in a show of comfort. Check and I balls. immediately check your balls. <laughs> <laughs> it's there, right? I mean, tell me it's there. Yeah, I know you're good. Okay. Your skin does feel slightly cold. 
What? Just a little. Just maybe it's a cold in the air. Oh, clammy. Come on. I'm going to open my doctor's bag and I need to get a temperature on her. Okay. Bend over. <laughs> <laughs> Your temperature seems fine. So I'm flustered by everything that just happened. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, also understand that he's freaking out about his hour brother. <laughs> Does that make you want to roll a stability? So, yeah, let's, let's check that. Yeah. I got a six. This is fine. Everything's fine. I'm just going to sit over here and drink my tea in the flaming house. Um, Which is good because I don't want to know what happened with you, Rosa. Because <laughs> it would only make me lose my stability. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure um, you're going to tell me anyway. I went to the library and, and looked into the fate of low manisty. And there was actually two low manisties. There's this manisty, there's low manisty, and then there's lower manisty. Both of the other ones were destroyed. Uh, the first one, I, th I think, must have been some kind of natural disaster because all the buildings were just torn apart. And Low Manisty had a rash of deaths, so perhaps a plague. I guess not much to say, and I'm not sure if I feel better or worse about that, to be honest. So then you hear, Low Manisty? <laughs> so this drunken, smelly man from earlier saunters over to your table and sits down. Puts out a dirty hand says, Eugene, nice to meet you. Ma'am. And he kind of nods to you, Rosa. Eugene, that's a very interesting watch you have there. May I see your wrist? Oh, this old thing, sure, but uh, it's a little scuffed. I hope you don't mind. Pulse checked. <laughs> P -p -p Pulse checked. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's hale and hearty. Great, great. It's a, little, it's a little fast because his blood is thin from all the alcohol. The librarian told me about you. She said you might know more. Oh, my dad was always a tall tale teller. He talked about low manisty. It was destroyed brick by brick, he said. And everyone in it died. And people moved back anyway. He said it was the stupidest thing you could do. Especially considering what happened to lower manisty, which was also destroyed brick by brick. And here we are in manisty. Well... How long do you think it'll be, he used to say, until they build an upper manisty? And he laughs <laughs> and pounds the table. <laughs> uh. That manisty fell over, sank into the swamp, and then burned down. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But this manisty stayed up. <laughs> yes, we are truly a role-playing game podcast now. <laughs> We've referenced the Holy Grail. <laughs> so Eugene says, oh, I used to go in the ruins all the time as a boy and pick around all kinds of strange things you find in there. It's a it's a bones, don't you know? And so sometimes you find a bit of gold here or there. <laughs> I felt like felt like a pirate, you know. <laughs> he gets very serious, but of course it's a place of the dead. We must be somber and respectful. You couldn't point us in the direction of these ruins, could you? Because well, if the price is right. I could take you there myself. <laughs> I can give you a real local tour. <laughs> I will go to the bar and pay for the gentleman's next three drinks for when we return. Oh, very generous, very generous. Well, please, if, if you're just warm enough, follow me. So he takes you to ruins. Um, it looks like this place was completely destroyed. Not just like, oh, some of the buildings are knocked down and whatnot. Does any of you have an architecture? Oh, 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 it's me, it's me. Rosa, you've been on some archaeological digs and you've, you've unearthed foundations and you looked around places that were but are no longer. And you're familiar with the way structures can fail and fall, but this is peculiar. These ruins, the buildings are scattered as if by an earthquake, but there's so many bricks that were just split in half. You see Eugene go, yeah, check this out, and he tosses a rock. And you notice it's actually a brick. I swear the marks on the brick where it was split in half are teeth marks. I'm gonna hold it up to Michael. Because I know because of my medicine? Yeah. You can confirm. You have no idea what these are from. You would say they look humanoid, but there's too many of them. Like as if there's rows upon rows of them. And then you look around and you start noticing the pattern in these bricks. They're all like that. Eugene, what what do they say happened to this town? <laughs> oh, it depends who you ask, my dear. It depends who you ask. Some people, the smart ones, they'll just tell you it's an earthquake. Some people say, oh, it's an Indian attack. But if you think this is great, wait till you come see 
lower, Manistee. And he grabs you by the hand and leads you excitedly down towards the shore. He goes, all right, I know you're fancy folks, but come on down here. And he leads you to this little, I mean, if anything of these buildings can be said to be standing still. Um, it's a little slow corner and he kind of scoops away at the sand. He goes, I used to come in here, look at these all the time as a kid. And he's scooping away at the sand, he's scooping away. And he unveils this little cluster of bricks that someone has reassembled, it looks like. Uh, it's a pattern of scratches and it looks like a sketch. And he pieces it together and picks a humanoid figure with worm-like arms and legs climbing from the soil. Yeah, go ahead and give me a stability check. I got a four. Yeah, you're good to go. Like, oh, she must have heard this story before. This is fine. I've generaled one. I suppose I have to. Yeah. Three. All right, you're losing three more, my friend. <laughs> so if he's at negative three, what does that mean? Negative six. Negative six. And you are officially oh. blasted. Your flavor blasted. <laughs> so what does it mean to be blasted? You suffer as shaken. You also permanently lose one point of stability. You are reduced to a gibbering mess. You really can't do anything else until you rest for a while. You could also try to act within a drive. So what's your drive that you have on your character sheet? Uh, thirst for knowledge. I think you've been following that along pretty well so far. You've been trying to learn things about this. So this is not charity. Uh, I'm going to give you a two-point bonus to your stability. So I think you're at negative four currently. Because all of these horrible discoveries have been in pursuit of knowledge. It was these beasties. They don't like us on this land. And they'll come back to clean us off every now and then. <laughs> well, it's cold, and I'm sobering up, and I hate it. So let's get back. What do you say? As a lady, I have to get my own room because I can't share a room right. with a man. Who's your brother? It's still weird for me. Listen, we're barely at hand-holding. We can't share our bed. So you notice there's a bunch of people in the hotel dancing to Static? Oh, this must be the new Cole Porter song. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, now you're catching it, on. And he goes, what, you guys don't like Fred Astaire? Why don't you come and dance for a while? It's cheek to cheek. You guys don't like cheek to cheek? I'm going to try to dance, but I can't really follow the beat because I can't hear it. So Ada goes, I, I, think, I think maybe you should just lie down here. You're embarrassing yourself, please. <laughs> so she sells you a room. Uh, Richard, cool. are you staying in Jeffrey's room? I have no other option. Yes, I'm going to stay in Jeffrey's room. All righty. You can get another room. Yeah, but I, mean, I think you're weird for it, but it's an option. Besides the stents of death, he's got a nice room. <laughs> <laughs> this time I've got the Murphy bed. So, Richard, I think you collapse into a completely dreamless sleep. Rosa, you sleep fitfully. You have a smile on your face and you dream you're laughing. Your hair is blowing in a breeze. And people around you are smiling. Unlike earlier tonight, you're dancing. You're dancing in a big stone circle. Your movements are strange. You hold your arms out to the side. And you're leaping and whirling. The dance is complicated. And yet, without thinking, you execute the steps perfectly. Your body moving more on instincts than on any training. It's as if you were born with this dance. In the middle of the circle, you see a figure. It's Michael. He's holding the knife you saw earlier, gleaming gold and green, pink. He's holding it above a human sacrifice. It's Jeffrey. He slits his throat, cuts his back, cuts his calves. He rolls into the deep pit in front of him. Yes, this is good. You wake up. Well, that sucks. Now it's my turn to be downstairs first. Yeah, but I think you're pretty shook. Maybe you want to roll a stability check, Jen? Oh, absolutely, she does. Yeah. I got a one. You lose three stability. Zero. Okay. I think that you have an itch. You keep itching oh. where you saw the man being cut on your neck and on your back and on the back of your legs. The skin is, isn't feeling quite right there anymore. That sounds terrible awesome. You wake up and you hear what sounds like music. Okay, I'm going to get up and look for the music. Michael, you also hear this music and it wakes you up out of your sleep. It's, it's late at night. It's maybe two hours before dawn. Is it music or the static we've become to know is music? It's music. It's beautiful music. Not anything in the top 40, though. It's drums and some kind of singing, I suppose you'd call it. Pipes. 
you would just you have to follow it. It's coming from the direction of the old farmhouse. You're both going to meet in the lobby, both hearing this music. Is that fair? Yeah. That's fair. You well, first to... I imagine that I'm going to walk up to him and like hold like both his hands like at the forearms. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Do you hear it? Yes, I I heard it. It it it, it woke me. I it seems like it's coming from the schoolhouse, right? It's music, though. Actual music. And we haven't actually talked about the fact that we haven't been hearing music up to this point. I mean, the same with you, right? Like, I've just been hearing static. I thought I was going insane. No, me too. We have to find it. You trace the noise down the long road to the old schoolhouse, and as you approach, the tune grows more insistent, the rhythm pounding and the pitch writhing. It is like the heartbeat of a dying man. From the school gates, you see Eliza and Bethany dancing in the schoolyard. It is the dance you dreamed about. With intense focus and skill, they hold their arms outstretched, leaping and whirling in bizarre patterns. They dance around the dark shape on the ground. It's a pig. Eugene's missing pigs. You get closer, you're not noticed by the girls. The girls have cut the throat and the shoulders and the calves using a stolen bread knife from the kitchen. <laughs> now they dance in its blood, which spreads in a large, dark circle on the grass. In the darkness, the twins' legs and nightdress appear black. But now, as you grow closer, you see that it's congealed blood. Beside the twins is a wireless radio, which the girls have carried from their home. It plays static, but in the static, you can hear the music that awoke you. I feel like this is also a sand check, because there's, like, girls dancing in blood. Yeah, give me a stability check. That's the one. I got a three. Five. Richard's almost flavor blasted. I'm at negative four. I think you run up and stop the girls. I think you start screaming at them to stop. They do, and they're, like, almost like they're shook and awake. And the radio returns to static, and the girls start crying. It's not fair. It's not fair. I don't know why it's not working. The dance never works, they say. The thing that never comes back to life like it's supposed to. We tried it on a dog before, and it didn't work then either. They're supposed to sink into the ground. And then they're supposed to be alive again, like in the dreams. You have the dreams? And then you see the door fly open to their house, and you see Mary appear, and she's running down towards you. She says, what is happening? And she sees the girls, she starts screaming. She's like, oh my God. And she gathers them up in the house and she's like, you have to come quick. I don't know what's happening. And she brings them in and out of the blood. And she, you can hear her say, this has happened again. Again, girls, I told you not to do this. Gonna go with her because she seems to know what is happening. And I do not. So you get back there and, and Mary has rushed the girls into the bathtub and you can hear them crying and complaining. And she says, no, you scrub yourself clean. I will not have this in my house. And she shuts the door and she comes back out. And she's very shaken. There's blood on her hands. And she goes, oh, no. And she starts washing her hands. She said that they said they wouldn't do it again. They said they wouldn't do it again. Mary, what are they trying to do? And she puts her hands on the, on the edge of the sink and she takes a deep breath. And she said, they've been having these dreams. They've been having these dreams about a dance. And they say that when they dance around something that's dead, that it comes back or it sinks into the earth and then comes back. They've... Last time it was a dog. It was our, our pet dog. And they killed it and they did the same thing. And I told them, this is just a dream. You can't do this. It doesn't work like this. But Jack complained of strange dreams too. And what you saw in the mirror before he, he died, he said he didn't like what was looking back at him. He said it was a monster. And then he disappeared. And she walks over to the kitchen table and she grabs a box. She goes, here, I found this. I thought of this. It's in, it was in the attic. It was his. And the mentions of the maiden house, this, this little place up in the up on the hills where he used to visit by himself. We're leaving this place. We're going to bring him into the city, and they're going to get help. They're, they're going to get help. I don't care. They have to be locked up. They're going to get help. This isn't right. And you shouldn't come back here. And she looks. She goes. I know this is your family home, but you shouldn't come back here. Have enough sense to know that it's a lost cause. And she goes back into the bathroom with the girls, and she slams the door. I'm going to look in the box. It's a map with a location marked for the Maiden House. And it's in between the town of Manistee 
and a place that looks like a stone circle on a hill. The other things in the box are the books on, on the cult lore and that sort of thing. You know, the huge. I'm, I'm, I'm going to read that. I'm a nerd. Mm-hmm. It's a book on something called The Great Cycle. Uh, one volume in this box is of folklore covering the great cycle that lasts just over a century. And every time the cycle comes around, the monsters rise up from the ground. They tear down the human towns. You see there's little scratched notes on the side in your father's handwriting. It says they destroyed low Manistee, destroyed the town before that. And soon they will rise again to destroy Manistee itself. Are you going to go to the circle or are you going to go to that, that house on the hill? The, they're equidistant, so the house is in between Manistee and the circle. Well, let's go to the house first then. Yeah, I imagine you're just like, we're going now. All right, because you're both like, you're holding on to the very tiniest threads of, <laughs> yeah. of like functionality at this point. So on the other side of this, several hills, you walk through in the moonlight. Because I remind you, it's like three in the morning. You see the sun rising. There's no road to what is marked on the map as Maiden House, nor a footpath. You just trek across open land and eventually come up on this small shack, really. It's two stories. It looks like it's ready to fall over any time. The windows are shuttered, but the door is unlocked. You walk in, and inside is the smell of dust, wood, and something else. The scent of bile and soil. The floorboards creak deafeningly loud in the stillness. If you didn't know better, you'd say this was where your father spent his final days. Papers and books are scattered everywhere. A mad collection of sketches and scribbling and quasi-scientific diagrams. There's a portable gas cooker. A mirror hangs on the wall, scratched out where the face should be. I'm going to say I'm going to drop to my knees and start scouring through the sure. chaos. There's, there's also a ladder leading to the second floor. I'll go upstairs and investigate. So on the upper floor, there are two rooms. To the left, there's a box room containing crates and kitchen utensils, scrap paper, clothes, etc. To the right is a bedroom. On the windowsill in the bedroom, you see a knife. It's pink and green gold, wickedly curved. It seems familiar to you, Michael. All right, then I have to grab the knife. And I think at that point you make it back downstairs. Rosa, Rosa, look what I found. Look what I found. It's a knife. Look at this. And I'm like waving in your face. (laughs) I'm going to do a stability check. Yeah. I got a five. Oh, good. You definitely recognize this knife. This is the knife from your dreams. You don't recognize using any of your skills what civilization this could have come from. The design is way too modern or advanced for any ancient people to have made this thing, as far as you could tell. It's beautiful. It's perfect. It's a thing out of time, though. Where did this come from? Who had made this? What is it made of? And then you begin reading the papers gathered in your hands. Do they tell me things about the knife? They don't. They tell you a lot of things. You... See that Jack has drawn many monsters, which look like humans in some pictures, maybe himself, or at least what he believes himself to be. However, you notice a darkness at the bottom of each one. Before you thought it was mere shading, but you wonder now whether it's significant. It looks like a large creature that's spawning worm-like monsters. Some impossibly large thing birthing out these worm men. And it's about that time that the radio in this room kicks on. Is it static or music? It's neither. It's a voice. And it says, Rosa, Michael, I have missed you so. And soon Jeffrey will be here too. He will join us soon. When your mother took you from me, I did not worry. Because I knew you would be back. And here you are, my children. So I'm going to make you both roll a stability check. Five. A one one and a five. All right, so Richard, you don't lose any stability. Jenna, you lose seven stability. (laughs) Cool. What does that put you down to? I'm at negative 11. Negative 11? I have great news. I'm irrevocably crazy? You're irrevocably crazy. (laughs) I'm just going to start screaming and cover my ears. Ongoing screaming. Yep, you scream. You try to drown out the static in the voice. And through the screaming, clear as bell, you hear shh, shh. 
and you remember this sound. This is a sound that your father used to do as he touched your hair and patted your back to comfort you and a toddler when you had a bad dream. And in that sound, you know that he loves you. And he wants nothing more than for you to return to him with your brother. Now you have the knife and you've seen the dance and you know what you have to do. I drop my hands from my ears. I start laughing. You hear good girl. Michael, you hear good girl. Now, Jeffrey is ready. He is. And it struggles for the word. Ripe. Just as you will be, my son. Soon. Go and fetch your brother from the hospital. Bring him to the, the dancing place. The girls will be there already. We're going to pick up the knife. And just head out the door, like, well, obviously. Michael, what are you doing? No, I think I'm pleading with Rosa to get the hell out of here. But father said, Michael. No, you're holding a knife. We're talking about dead bodies, disembodied voices. We're getting the hell out of here. This is getting too strange for me. So you hear music again coming from the radio, coming from the ground beneath the radio, coming from the hill. It's calling you. Dance with me, Michael. <laughs> like, uh, and I, I grab his one hand because I assume I have the knife in the other hand. Mm -hmm. And and start to dance. Jenna, you feel no pulse. Is he ripe? <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you tell him this, Michael? Michael, it's time. We can go now. <laughs> I want to use my athletics. You're gonna knock me out? Yeah. It'd be scuffling. Which is a six. Yeah. So I, I need to scuffle with her, try to get the knife out of her hand, subdue her. If I have to knock her out, so be it, and literally drag her out of there. So, Jenna, do you have a scuffling or athletics in your character sheet? I do not have either. So you can roll a, a d6, and Richard, you can roll and spend. See, if I use all my scuffling now, if I got to fight a, a Dracula or something, I won't have enough. <laughs> Later. That's true. So I will spend three. Alrighty. And then roll. God damn it, I rolled a six. <laughs> so you have a nine. Jenna, you can't beat that. So Yeah, I got a three anyway. So before he even rolled, he had already won. Oh, well, I, I do it gently because I don't want to hit a woman. I, I Vulcan yeah. next pincher. There you go. And you hear your father's voice say, Jeffrey's already on his way to the circle. I don't know why you're fighting this. I want you to claim your birthright, boy. Join us. I know you felt it. The soil. I know you've swam in it in your dreams. Dig the hole. Free your brother. Don't let this gift be wasted. Uh, using my athletics, I put her up on my shoulders and I run the hell out of there. You're out of there. Where are you going? <laughs> Uh, I'm going to have to try to meet Jeffrey somewhere on the path and dissuade him from sure. the altar. How long am I going to be knocked out for? A minute or so. You find Jeffrey fairly easily. He's His skin is like sluicing off of him at this point. It looks like a, a bad costume. And he's running towards the hill. You see him clear as day. Well, clear as moonlight anyway. And he sees you and goes, Brother, it's time, please, to the hill. Have you the knife? Probably not picking up was a better call. Yeah, I don't want I don't want to be anywhere near that thing. It looks spooky. So he, he's like, join me, please. And he runs he's trying to run up to the hill. Jeffrey, no, this is crazy. We we have to go. I've got our sister. We need to get the heck out of here right now. I don't care what you're hearing. Let's go. We can find a cure for you when we get back to New York. You're coming with us right now. You don't understand. If I don't get into the ground. If you don't cut me with that blade, I'll die. You have to help, please. And you can see he's desperate now. He, he sees down to his knees and says, Brother, I've never asked you for a thing, but I need this now, please. Let me join Father. And then soon you'll join us. Look, the twins are waiting already. And you can see up on the hill in the circle, there's two little girls and they're dancing. I'm and awake starting... now. Great, so now I'm out number two to one. In and crazy. now I'm going to start... Kicking and hitting him. Jeffrey turns from you and starts running up the hill. He says, sister, the knife, please. Okay. Now you can see bits of his skin dropping off as you're running. I think you have fleeing, don't you? 
I do. But, I mean, will that get me off of him? I would say so. He can always try to contest it with athletics. So it'd be a fleeing versus athletics role. You can both spend. Okay. I'm going to say I'm going to spend two. So it's a D6 and whatever you want to add to that. Yeah, I'm going to add a five. <laughs> All right. I do not want this to happen. Yeah, it's not happening. <laughs> yeah, ten. All right, and you got a what, Jen? I got a four. You make a beeline, but he's just too strong. I'm literally he, grabbing her by her ankles as she's right. crawling on the grass trying to get away from me. And you see Jeffrey reach the top of the hill. The twins are dancing. You're going to make him dead, Michael. You're going to kill him. You see Jeffrey raise his arms and lie down prone in the middle of the circle, and he's not moving. Can I use my preparedness? Well, actually, I had had the foresight before, too. Yep. Neat. <laughs> you have to spend it, and then if you're trying to get some big weird thing, it's going to be a pretty big spend. And then you should justify whatever it is fictionally as to why you would have it. Four. Okay. And I rolled a three. So you have a total of seven, so you've succeeded. When I heard the music, before I left, I took the Derringer out of my handbag and put it in the pocket of my robe. So I am going to roll over, point it at him, and tell him that I need to save our brother, and then I'll save him too. And then I'm going to fire. Oh, damn. Okay. You just shoot me? Yep. I'm great. I am nearly irrevocably crazy. The Derringer in the book has two shots, and, and the old, those style of pistols, you could squeeze both triggers at the same time. Because you've got a top barrel and a bottom barrel. Uh-huh. Are you squeezing them both at the same time, or just one? No, I only need one. All right, so it's a four to hit. You're not wearing any kind of ablative armor there, Michael, so roll damage. Six. Six, and roll again. Five. You take 11 health damage there. Uh, all right, so now at negative one health. You're free now there, Rosa. What are you doing? I'm getting the knife. I got shit right. to do on that hill. She runs back, and I think she gets a, a good jump on you, given that you've been shot there, Michael. You hear the music in the radio saying, Good, good, yes, yes, free your brother. The time is now. Okay, so I'm going to scoop up the knife. And what are you doing now, Michael? You've recovered a bit. Your sister's taking her across the hills with the knife in her hands, heading toward your brother. I feel like I should chase, but I also feel like I just might want to get the fuck out. Yeah, but I feel like I'd want to save my brother at all costs. And she's already spent her weapon. You spent a lot of it. Yeah, well, yeah she hasn't re reloaded that at all, so yes. Because I have a, a six for knowledge of firearms. So yep. I'm saying I know that she's out of bullets. Yeah, that makes total sense to me. I, I have to follow. I think weekly you're running up. Yeah. And if you want to get there faster, you can do an athletics check. But if not, you're going to get there after she does. The girls on the hill notice that you haven't brought a shovel or anything. So they're scraping at the dirt with their fingers trying to get a spot for Jeffrey to roll into to touch the dirt himself. Rosa, you reach the top of the hill. Ecstatic. This is the time. This is what you've been missing in your life. And I take my hair down so that it blows like in the dream. Beautiful. All of that feeling of ennui, of not belonging, of it's gone now. You are exultant. This is what you were doing. And one day, it will be your turn to follow. You lean down. You feel your newfound brother's hair in your hands. The loose skin of the scalp pulls back sickeningly, strangely in your hand. You draw the curved blade across his neck. It splits like overripe melon. It spills a black kick around to the earth. You make an X on his shoulder blades and on his calves, and you see beneath a gray skin, segmented, writhing like the underside of a caterpillar. The twins begin to dance and call a strange song, and you begin to dance as well. At the last moment, Michael crests the hill to see his brother, not his brother, this thing inside of his brother, wriggle free. The thing that was Jeffrey crawls from the flesh, finally free of the sickening, damp prison, that costume. And he touches the earth, and you hear inside of both of your heads, good, this is good. And the creature swims into the earth like a shark in water, disappearing in an instant. The soil appears undisturbed. The twins raise their mouths to the sky in an oily cry, scream into the moon. Michael, roll me one last stability check. Two. 
because Jeffrey was one of your pillars of stability, you lose eight stability points. Negative 12. <laughs> you know now, in this moment, that all your struggles were vain. And in fact, you realize that the wound in your shoulder isn't bleeding. It's just sort of leaking a thin ichor. And you smile, because soon you know that you will be ripe. And how blessed are you to have your sister there to transition you when it's time. You smile. You raise your mouth up to the sky and join the voice of your father, of your brother, of your sisters and half-sisters, and all of those that came before you, all the wearings, and you shriek the call of your family. It echoes throughout the hill, and in the distance, the ground rumbles. The lights flicker out in menesty. The stars are right. So yeah, that was Trailer Cthulhu, The Dance in the Blood by Graham Walmsley. Uh, I hope you both had a lot of fun. I did. I shot Richard. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Uh, Richard and Jenna, you guys are excellent. You guys are amazing. How do you feel? Deeply Strangely disturbed. <laughs> I don't think anything sums up the experience of Trailer Cthulhu better than that. I, I love this, this one. This was a really solid session. Really good adventure. I'll provide where to find this adventure in the show notes so that you can get a, your own copy of that and support this excellent, excellent author. He's written a lot of stuff for this game, and it's all aces. Uh, Graham Walmsley, if you're listening to this, I love you. And I mean that. Thank you for listening. If you like what you hear today, please go on to iTunes and, and rate us five stars so we can reach a wider audience. If you have any questions or concerns, please email us at potablunders at gmail.com or tweet at us at pot of blunders and of course you can see all of our homebrew content our reviews and more episode information on potofblunders.com for our wonderful podcast family i once again leave you with may all of your d's be 12s yes it's a healthy 94.2 percent or whatever what? degrees <laughs> percent <laughs> Percent. You're a robot. Did I mention you're a robot? Because it's pretty important. <laughs>